Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Julius Matona. Today, the topic of our program will be something which is very peculiar to the Catholic Church, namely the devotion to the Sacred Heart. What do Catholics mean when they say devotion to the Sacred Heart? How can one be devoted to, to the Sacred Heart? When did this come about? With us today to discuss this subject is the Reverend Clarence Kelly, spiritual father of the Daughters of Mary, a congregation of traditionalist nuns in Round Top, New York. Father Kelly, welcome to our program. It's a pleasure to be here, Julius. Father, what do, uh, what do Catholics mean and what is understood by the phrase devotion to the Sacred Heart? Well, as background, before uh, we specifically get into that, I would like to read a verse from the third chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Uh, in fact, it's verse 16, a verse with which uh, many, many people are familiar. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that those who believe in him may not perish, but may have life everlasting. And what John the Apostle is saying here is that the Father was moved by his own goodness and by his love for us so much that he sent his son into the world to die on the cross that we may have everlasting life. And devotion to the Sacred Heart is a recognition, an acknowledgement of this immense love of God, most specifically in the incarnate Word of God. The Son became a man and willingly went to the cross for our sins. And the motive, the thing which moved him, that drove him to shed his precious blood upon the cross was his, his love for us, this immense love for us. And so the, the church says uh, that we should be ever mindful of this great love that burns in the heart of our blessed Savior. Now, we specifically are devoted to the actual heart of Jesus because it is the heart of our God, and the heart is a symbol of, of love. It's a symbol of uh, his own love for us. Uh, that's what's called the material object of devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the formal object of this devotion, the thing which we reverence and respect and adore and love, is the very love itself which is, uh, which is in our blessed Savior. So, so what is the devotion to Sacred Heart? It is a devotion to the love of our blessed Savior for us. I see. How did uh, this particular devotion come about? What was the, the history surrounding it? Certainly it, it didn't as such exist from, say, the third century. It must have begun at a certain point in time. Well, uh, the devotion uh, as it is today is uh, not found, let us say, in sacred scripture or in the, uh, in the early years of the church, but uh, in a different form it's there. Uh, in other words, the, the church was always mindful of the love that burned in the heart of our Lord for us and that it was that love which, which compelled him in a certain sense uh, to the cross. And the, the church responded to that great love uh, and so in the early years of the church among the fathers we see, for example, the devotion to, to the wound in our Lord's side because they know it was through that wound that his heart was pierced and outflowed the blood and water which were symbols of the sacraments, the expressions of our Lord's love for us, the means of our salvation. So the, the root of it is there. In other words, the love of our Lord for us is there and, uh, and a, a devotion to that love is there. However, it became formalized uh, much later uh, in the revelations of uh, St. Gertrude and uh, St. MacTilde and certain other saints, but it never became widespread, uh, at least not until uh, the 17th century through the instrumentality of a young nun by the name of Margaret Mary. And our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary and uh, said to her that she was to be the apostle of his sacred heart and that uh, she would be his instrument to spread this devotion throughout the world. What, uh, what is the doctrinal weight 
attached to something like this. I mean, this is certainly in the realm of private revelation. And it seems that, the, well, the Church teaches that all formal revelation <coughs> ended with the, the death of St. John, the last apostle who was living. Uh, to what degree uh, are Catholics bound by these private revelations? I mean, how does it fit into the scheme of things, so to speak? Well, the, the, the root of the devotion, the dogmatic root of the devotion, is not the revelation of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary. The root of the devotion is the incarnation. See, the eternal Son of God who proceeds from the mind of the Father became a man of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that eternal Son of God has a true human nature and a true divine nature. But that human nature, which he received by the power of the Holy Ghost of the Blessed Virgin Mary, is now the human nature of God. So the human nature that he assumed, being the human nature of God, is worthy of the same worship that we give to to the divine nature, be <clears throat> insofar it is the human nature of God. So the doctrinal basis for the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is that he is truly the Son of God, and that that human nature is truly the human nature of God. And so we Catholics, we give only one form of worship to our Lord, and it is the worship given to God himself. So the, the doctrinal root of the devotion is the Incarnation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the revelations to St. Margaret Mary by our Lord were, you might say, the catalyst which moved the Church to proclaim this devotion far and wide. What were some of the specifics uh, surrounding these revelations? What, uh, what, what came from them? What, were there any new lights or were any old lights on the truths of the religion reinforced by these revelations? Well, uh, was it even moved? What moved God then? Assume these revelations were approved as being legitimate. What moved God to uh, appear in such a way to this nun, to the right. world? It's, it's interesting that you ask that because uh, at an earlier time, our Lord appeared to St. Gertrude. And uh, as St. John rested his head upon the breast of our Lord at the Last Supper, St. Gertrude did. And when St. Gertrude heard the beatings of the Sacred Heart and was so filled with love for our Lord, she on another occasion asked St. John the Apostle who appeared to her, why did you not tell us about this? At the Last Supper, you rested your head upon his sacred breast. Why did you not tell us about this? And St. John told St. Gertrude at this, uh, the time of this uh, apparition, he said that this was to be reserved for the latter days when the world was grown cold in its uh, love for God. God would reveal the immensity of this love under the symbol of the Sacred Heart. So that would be the reason why the, the explicit devotion and the widespread devotion was reserved for these latter days. Were there any uh, striking new visions on, on love God had for men? Uh, did any of these emerge from these series of revelations? I, I'm aware that uh, actually she's not Margaret Mary, she's Saint Margaret Mary. Saint actually Margaret wrote Mary. an autobiography where she described uh, these experiences. Is there anything which uh, is, would perhaps move man to have a deeper appreciation for the love God has for him? I think so. There were many, many apparitions of our Lord to Saint Margaret Mary. There were three major apparitions. And they took place successively in the years 1673, 1674, and 1675. And in the year 1673, our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary, and like a, a father with a little child, his little girl, he, uh, he called her to himself, and she rested her head upon his sacred breast and she tells us that our Lord revealed to her the mysteries of his love on that occasion. In the apparition in 1674, our Lord revealed to St. Margaret Mary his five wounds, the wounds in his hands and feet and in his side, except instead of seeing blood coming from the wounds uh, in the sacred body of our Lord, she saw 
a blazing fire. She describes it as, uh, as uh, five suns. She says that uh, his five wounds shone as five suns. And uh, the third major apparition was an apparition in which our Lord re actually revealed to her his sacred heart. And on that occasion, he said to her, Behold the heart which has loved men. And he complained to her on that occasion that although he loved them with such an immense love, that all he received in return was coldness and indifference. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, from reading her autobiography was the demands, what God demands of men. We, it was very striking. First, we, we see the love, the enormous love that God has for man, but unfortunately, it was a two-way street, and it demanded a certain reciprocity. Could you perhaps uh, discuss a little bit what does God expect from us, especially with regards to these revelations? I would, and I uh, would draw a comparison between what one might call, and I say this with no intention to offend anyone, but uh, a comparison between what one might call the Catholic Christ and the Protestant Christ. Mm -hmm. See, they're two different persons, actually. Uh, even though I, I know uh, it is true that in the minds of, uh, of many Protestants that's not so, but, but really the idea of Christ in the mind of Protestant theology and the idea of Christ in the mind of Catholic theology, they're two different persons. They're different persons from two points of view from the point of view of his immense and tender love for his creatures, and from the point of view of the demands that he makes. It is very clear that uh, the, the love of our Lord is, is a most tender and extraordinary love, and at the same time, it is a most demanding love. And here's why I say the Catholic Christ is different from the Christ of Protestant theology. That is perhaps a better way to put it than the Protestant Christ. The Christ of Protestant theology is a kind of cold Christ. For example, uh, when people read about the incident that took place at the wedding feast of Cana, where our Lord seemed to refuse a request of the Blessed Virgin Mary, they interpret this as somehow our Lord publicly rebuking his mother. Mm -hmm. And there was another incident in the Gospel where uh, a woman said, uh, blessed is the, the womb that bore thee and the breast that nursed thee. Right. And he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear, hear the word of God, God and keep, keep it. it. Right. And they interpret this as somehow a rebuke to his mother. Well, in, uh, in, in, in the Catholic Christ, so to speak, it is inconceivable that the, so tender and loving a heart as our Lord has, that he would publicly rebuke his mother. It's I inconceivable. And of course, we know that that's not the case. He didn't really rebuke her. However, uh, for example, the Christ of a Jimmy Swaggart could publicly rebuke and in a certain sense, sense insult his mother. It's, it's just unthinkable. The author of the fourth commandment, our Lord is the, the one who made the fourth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, and yet uh, someone like Jimmy Swaggart or those who follow his theology theology of other Protestants, where this is a cold Christ, he would publicly rebuke his mother. And secondly, uh, the great divergence between the Catholic Christ and the Protestant Christ is the demands that he uh, uh, lays upon us. In, uh, in the Protestant Christ, he is not demanding at all. He simply says, if you accept me as your Lord and Savior, that's good enough. Well, Believe and trust in me. It seems that the, the Protestant notion is, is that Christ died for your sins, once is enough, and that's it. Whereas the Catholic theology says that this sacrifice is renewed at the Mass and these merits are applied anew each time. Yes, but uh, to take it one step further, Christ demands of us not only that we believe Him and believe in Him, but He demands that we love Him. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. In Protestant theology, Christ does not demand to be loved. And that's why it's perfectly reconcilable with Protestant doctrine that a person could believe in Christ, trust in him, and still offend him and be saved, still go to heaven. Once he's saved, he's saved, no matter what he does. 
And that, that is the great divergence. The Catholic Christ, in fact, the Christ of sacred scripture, is a Christ who demands that we love him, mm -hmm. who requires that we love him. And the measure and sign of our love for him is obedience to the commandments. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is necessary to love him and to obey the commandments in order to get to heaven. Yeah, one, uh, one thing which, which struck me in, in reading Margaret Mary's uh, autobiography was the enormous demands, in fact, that Christ uh, places upon men. And in fact, the, the uh, existed in her biography that Christ or God, the slightest transgression was punished with utmost severity. So it seems, according to these revelations, that if you believed mightily and sinned even more mightily, that you would pay for it. You certainly would pay yeah. for it. Uh, our Lord said it uh, when he was on earth. He said, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Imagine that. We have to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. What, uh, what an extraordinary demand. <laughs> What, uh, what does, according to Catholic theology, the future hold in store for those who say are good but aren't perfect? What's going to happen to them? Well, uh, a necessary requirement uh, for uh, the salvation of one's soul is that one dies in a state of sanctifying grace. Mm -hmm. The grace that we receive at baptism, we must maintain. If we lose that grace, we must be restored to that grace mm -hmm. by a worthy confession. Mm -hmm. uh, as our Lord said to the apostles after his resurrection from the dead, he said, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. So there is there's a, a means by which he gave us in order to have sins committed after baptism forgiven. But we must die in the state of grace. If we do not die in the state of grace, we will be damned for all eternity. Mm -hmm. If we are in the state of grace and commit a serious sin, we lose that grace. And if we should die after committing that sin, we would be lost. Now, if we leave this earth in the state of grace, but less than perfect, we must be made perfect. There must be a means by which we are made perfect and therefore uh, able to enter uh, into heaven. And that, of course, is through purgatory. As it says in sacred scripture, it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. That's the book of Maccabees, as a matter of fact. That's correct. The uh, a difficulty I see, say some person is, is well-intentioned, says, yes, Father, I, I recognize the enormity of uh, God's love for us. My problem is, how do I love him in return? I never saw him. I don't know what he's like. Uh, how do I do this? I try to love him. I feel coldness. I don't feel an emotional pulsing, so to speak, when, right. I, when I think of him. How am I supposed to love him? How would you, what would you say? I would say, let's ask our Lord. What did our Lord say? And our Lord said very clearly in the Gospel of St. John, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he also said, if you keep my commandments, you love me. So the way we love our Lord and the way we demonstrate we love him is by obedience to his commandments. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we disobey his commandments, we do not love him. And it doesn't really matter what you feel. Whether you feel very pious or you don't is of relative insignificance. So this, this love is more of, a, of a, a willful, an act of the will and of the intellect rather than one of the heart in a certain sense that you're not going to feel an immediate consolation. There's no guarantee you're going to feel such a thing. In fact, you might feel dryness. Well, I, I wouldn't say of the heart, mm -hmm. I would say of the emotions. Mm -hmm. In other words, it doesn't have to be a love of the emotions, mm -hmm. but it definitely has to be a love of the heart. And the heart, of course, is a symbol of the love that's in our will. We love by an act of the will. Mm -hmm. I would compare it to the difference between a fire of straw and a coal fire. If you get a, a pile of straw and you light it, it ignites and you get a brilliant flame that lasts only for a moment. And that's equivalent to the kind of emotional type love that people think they should have for our Lord. Uh, but that, of course, is not necessary at all. However, the coal fire is a fire which gives constant and continual heat. And that is likened to a love 
the root of which is not in the emotions, but in the will. Well, it looks like this kind of love is a, a much more difficult thing because it's, it's difficult to gauge and it seems to require much greater faith. Well, it is. It's a very difficult thing because it requires obedience to the commandments and not only an external obedience, but an internal obedience. Will God give uh, anyone who is a trying to, say, be faithful and love him, will he reward him with any signs or, or recognition that you are, in fact, progressing in a path that is pleasing to me, or will this always be completely, you know, obscure to the particular soul? Well, uh, if a person uh, uses the means given to us to enable us to, to live a life in accord with the commandments of God, if we receive the sacraments regularly and faithfully, mm -hmm. we will become increasingly strong. Mm -hmm. Our fervor and our devotion will become greater and deeper. We will fall uh, fewer and fewer times into sin. And uh, that would be the sign. Fidelity to the will commands of our blessed Savior. There was a, perhaps one of the most striking aspects of this uh, all incidents, events surrounding St. Margaret Mary was these promises of the Sacred Heart that he made to St. Margaret Mary, and they were just stupendous. Could you please go into these? Y yes. Uh, the, here again is the, the Catholic Christ, the true Christ, is the Son of God made man who went to the cross, who was crowned with thorns and scourged and spit upon, and uh, who carried his own cross to the place of his execution and was nailed to that cross, Whose, whose heart was opened. I mean, just the image of our Lord is uh, St. Francis of Assisi says, you behold Christ on the cross, his head is bent to kiss you, his arms are uh, extended to embrace you, and his heart is open to receive you. Here is the image of God made man pleading with us, so to speak, pleading and begging us uh, to love him. And our Lord desires so much to be loved by us that he did indeed attach to uh, a return of love, uh, these stupendous promises. What were these uh, promises? Well, he promised, for example, that uh, anyone who would spread this devotion to his sacred heart, that his name would be inscribed in his heart, uh, never to be effaced. So the Lord is saying, if you spread this devotion, if you get other people to love me the way I desire to be loved by them, I will inscribe your name in my heart and your name never will be faced. Mm -hmm. He promised that he would give peace to homes, in, in homes where there's strife and hardship, and the husband is against the wife, and the wife against the husband, and the children against their parents. He says, you enshrine in your homes devotion to my sacred heart, and I will give peace to your homes. Mm -hmm. He also promised that those who would be devoted to his sacred heart would receive, uh, before they died, the grace is necessary for final repentance. Mm -hmm. And so wonderful, wonderful promises. He said that uh, uh, souls that were steeped in sin, if they are devoted to my sacred heart, I will give them the grace necessary to break the bonds of sin that hold them. Souls that are, that are tepid and kind of mediocre in the practice of their faith will become fervent souls. And those souls that are fervent will mount quickly to perfection. So this almost answers my question. If, if a person would uh, participate and do follow this devotion, he would quickly see himself progressing. And this would be a certain sign, in a sense. From well, God. He, he, he would, in, in a sense, yes, in a sense, no. Uh, he would become increasingly conscious of his defects mm -hmm. and of his faults and of his failings. But at the, at the same time, he would become increasingly alive with, with a, a true longing to, to do the will of our Lord. And after all, what is love? Love is, is, is to will the good of the beloved. Mm -hmm. What is the beloved want? That is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And if my beloved is the Son of God made man, if I love him and I want to give my heart to him, then I will will what he wills. What does he want? I will say to him, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And his response will be, obey my commandments. Very, uh, this, this again brings, we might touch on the doctrine of the cross. Then you would say, you know, Christ said himself, unless you shall bear you, uh, you, your cross, you'll perish. And so then 
ultimately tied in with this love is the suffering, the necessity for suffering. Yes. Could you ma mention something about that? Yes. He, he said, uh, he said if, if you want to be holy, in effect, you have to be like me. And I am a suffering savior. I shed my blood for the salvation of your soul. You must be like me. And St. Paul even went so far as to say that we have to fill up in our flesh what is lacking of the sufferings of Christ. And of course, objectively, nothing is lacking of the sufferings of Christ. But what he meant was what is lacking of the sufferings of Christ is our participation in them. We must become like Christ. The Lord said, where I am, there shall my servants be. We must be at the cross. Devotion to the Sacred Heart brings to fore the fact that the Catholic religion is a religion of suffering. But there is a sublime consolation. My burden is light, my yoke is sweet. Father Kelly, thank you for being with us.